Hey guys, Taki here. I recently bought a used Nintendo Switch for $120 and it came with a cool bonus. It was modded. Even though the Switch Lite is almost five years old at this point, it is a handheld that has only gotten better with time. In 2024, it is possible to overclock a Switch Lite to run games at 60 FPS, get video out via a USB cable, run desktop applications on a variety of Linux distros, and turn the Switch Lite into an Android gaming device. The Switch Lite is even powerful enough to emulate PlayStation 2, which is surprising enough, but did you ever expect that it'd be able to emulate Xbox games? I didn't. What about PC games? It can also do that. There are also a lot of hardware modding opportunities that are out there for the Switch Lite in 2024. We have third-party shells and buttons available in tons of colors, and hopefully very soon, we'll have that OLED screen replacement that I talked about in my community post. I'll talk more about this guy later in the video. This is gonna be a deep dive video on the Switch Lite in 2024, but before we cover any of that, I need to do some backstory. I already own one Switch Lite that I've had since 2019, but I wanted to buy a second one for the kid. If you saw my PSP video or my Nintendo DS video in this series, you know I start this process by checking out the secondhand market to see what is available where I live. Local used prices on the Switch Lite aren't that bad, and it's not uncommon to see these going for around $110 to $150, and this can include Switch Lights that have been hardware modded. As I mentioned, I bought the Switch Lite that I'll be using in this video for around $120 after a few hours of looking at local listings. And here it is. Given the price, this thing isn't perfect. It does have a few small scratches on the front and the back, but this is my favorite Switch Lite shell color from the official ones that Nintendo made. The Pokemon branding doesn't do anything for me at all, I just really like this gray shell color. This does have one problem, and that it has some stick drift on both of the joysticks, but that's a cheap fix. The best part of this whole thing is that it's already been hardware modded. Before we cover what we can do with a modded Switch, I'm gonna do what I usually do in this series. Typically, I will buy a handheld that is in way worse shape than this, and I'll use this as an opportunity to showcase and evaluate some of the third-party things that are out there. This one isn't bad, and realistically, all I would ever need to do is just swap over these two replacement joysticks that I have to get this ready to go for the little guy. But I want to personalize this. Pretty much every video in this series consists of me shell swapping a handheld to a blue transparent shell, and I don't want to break tradition, so that's exactly what we will do. This shell is still pretty good, so I may do a double shell swap to put my dark gray PCB into it because I like how this screen looks. I started this project by taking a look at what was available on the market where I live, and I tried to buy a bit of everything. This blue shell comes from the same company that I usually use for these videos, but I also bought a third-party clone shell from a no-name factory to see how it compares. I also bought an aftermarket OCA screen replacement, and I bought this because I read a lot of comments from people that said the aftermarket screens are bad for the Switch, and they showcase scan lines after a few weeks of use. I want to test that, and I want to benchmark the screen to see if it's better or worse than the stock one. I also bought joysticks from several companies. There are Hall Effect joysticks on the market for the Switch, but they aren't available in the color that I want to use for this project, so I won't be using them in this video. I also bought aftermarket screen borders and a replacement touch panel, as well as several types of replacement buttons. I'm going to try to cobble these all together to create a combination that I think looks good with the parts that I have. We're going to do a speed run of this shell swap process, but I do have some thoughts. Doing the shell swap on the Switch Lite isn't that bad. It's a bit easier than normal because I'm not trying to transfer over the original screen. When you cut that out of the equation, it's really just a matter of keeping track of your screws and being careful with that display connector. From memory, I think doing a PSP shell swap was a worse experience than this by far. Through the magic of editing, that entire process is now done. I was originally planning to go with white joysticks for this build, but those parts didn't arrive when I was doing this part of the video, so I had to go with what I had. I ended up going with the replacement joysticks I was planning on using for the original shell. In terms of case quality, I like how this turned out. I think the pictures that they have online of this do not do it justice. It's not as light of a blue color as my other shell swaps, but I think it looks awesome with the white buttons that I'm using. Unlike the yellow shell that I bought, this one feels like it's OEM quality. It's also a bit more vibrant than I was expecting. There is a bit in the middle where it's not fully flush like it would be with a stock shell, but this is minor and I only ever noticed it when I was filming this quick showcase. The SD card slot does stick out just a bit. I haven't had a chance to go back and see if that can be fixed. Beyond that, the rest of the shell is fine with no imperfections on the inside. As I mentioned, this is an OCA replacement screen. That just basically means that there's no air gap between the touch panel and the IPS screen. 
In terms of quality, the panel isn't completely uniform. If I were to look at a pure black image, there's a tiny amount of light bleeding over in the corner, along with an uneven centered image. I still need to do a benchmark of it to see if I want to keep it or not. I was planning on not keeping it because I thought that it would be significantly worse than stock, but that does not seem to be the case. I actually ended up doing two shell swaps for this video. I like the display of the used switch light that I bought so much that I wanted to use it over the one that I had in my original switch light. This one still needs some work because these are the older sticks that have drift. I bought another set and I have to wait for them to come in the mail before I can finally fix that issue. But yeah, I think this one is now better than it was before. And it also allows us to compare the better version of the stock switch light screens that I have against this replacement one. I still think the stock one looks slightly better because it's brighter. Anyway, here are the benchmark results. First of all, I am shocked by how accurate the stock screen is. It has nearly 100% of the sRGB coverage, and most of the color bands on the left side of the screen are under a delta E of 2, meaning they are properly calibrated. The RGB balance is a bit off, with the whites appearing more greenish blue, but the entire panel is decent overall. Peak brightness is also pretty good at 400 nits. When it comes to the replacement screen, it has a lower peak brightness of 268 nits, which kind of sucks, but it does have more accurate colors for everything except for blue and green. The new screen is slightly warmer than stock, but both screens have trash contrast ratios. This abysmal contrast ratio is why darker games do not look good on the Switch Lite. It is also why there is such a big difference between the stock Switch Lite screen and the OLED replacement screen for the Switch Lite. This is really the only metric of this screen that is a letdown compared to other normal IPS screens that are used in third-party handhelds. But now that we've gone through all of that, it's time to talk about what we can do with this modded Switch Lite. Because of everything that's going to follow this point, this is where I need to put a huge disclaimer for Nintendo's lawyers that this content is purely for educational purposes. Do not send your ninjas after me. Any Switch games that you see in this video are ones that I own, and I'll try my best to put the game in the frame to show you that I own it. Right now, I am in the emulated stock system. One of the biggest things that you can do in here is to pirate Switch games. You can just download games from the internet and then install them on your Switch. I don't do that, and I'm not going to showcase that in this video. That being said, there are some legitimate things that you can do to improve the gaming experience for the games that you own. These are things that I wish were in the stock system, and I want to go over a few of my favorites. The first thing that I like about this system is that we can have stats on the screen. Status Monitor has a few layouts to choose from, but I like the micro option because it reminds me of the Steam Deck layout that I typically use. This allows you to see the CPU and GPU utilization, along with CPU, GPU, and RAM frequencies. Beyond this, we also have temperature readings, fan speed, and FPS. I like having FPS readings on screen so I can determine the cause of slowdowns in games. If you guys don't know, the Switch processor is really underclocked by default. There is a lot more power in the Switch Lite that we cannot use by default. This game doesn't need a lot of power to run, but I still like having stats on my screen. At a minimum, I wish FPS and battery readings were visible, like this in the stock OS. That would at least mean that I wouldn't have to pull out this side menu to check battery levels when I'm in a game. The next thing that I like probably won't come as a surprise to any of you, but I like that we have full control over the processor. Right now we're in Super Mario Odyssey and I picked this game because it has a photo mode that is easy to push the system beyond what it can do in handheld mode. As you can see based on the FPS reading in the corner, we're not at 60, so this allows us to go over the next point. If we go into the sysclock menu, we can change the CPU and GPU frequencies along with the RAM speed. If I quickly go ahead and increase some values, you'll see that the game now runs at a lock 60 FPS in this mode. There's another point that goes hand in hand with this, and it is that we are able to force a docked mode resolution in handheld mode. Given that this is a Switch Lite, there is no official way to access docked mode resolution since it doesn't have native video out support. If you weren't aware, many Switch games don't even run at the native resolution of the display when they're in handheld mode, even though we have enough power to do so. In situations like that, you'd get a sub-resolution in handheld mode that might not look that great depending on the game. With reverse NXRT, we can override the system controls and force a docked resolution if we want. We could also force a handheld mode in docked mode if we want, but that doesn't do anything for this version of the Switch. Selecting dock mode isn't that drastic for this game, but there are other games that this would make a noticeable improvement over the visual quality of the game. Anyway, we're now running this game in docked mode at 60 FPS with no problems because we already increased our clock speeds. I just like that we're able to get more out of the hardware that we already bought. In this case, we made the system use more power, but we could also go in the other direction if we wanted to try and force the system to use less power in edge cases. The next thing that I like to do is increase the FPS in games that run at a locked 30 FPS by default. For these heavy titles, an overclocked switch does have the power to run these games entirely at 60 FPS or mostly outside of some very demanding areas. 
To start this, we will use a tool called FPS Locker to increase the FPS target to 60 FPS. For this game, we need to do a big overclock to get this to run at 60 FPS. Obviously, it's running at double the normal speed right now, which is not ideal unless you're trying to do a very fast speed run. If we use another tool called Edison, we can use a 60 FPS cheat code to fix the speed issue. Now we have this game running at 60 FPS on a switch light, and it looks awesome. I slow down the footage just to make it a bit easier to see how smooth the game is after we get everything going. The last notable feature that I like is video out support for the Switch Lite. With a tool called SysDVR, we can wirelessly send the video signal from the Switch Lite to a PC or an Android device. Your results with this will depend on your Wi-Fi signal. Right now, I have my Switch and my OLED Steam Deck running on a hotspot, so it isn't the best, but it is better than nothing. If this isn't enough, you also have the ability to do video out from your USB port. You still need to run an app on your connected device, but it works well, and I find that it looks better than the wireless video signal. Right now, I have this connected to a PC, and the PC is connected to this portable screen. To use this with a TV, you only need something that is capable of running the app and connecting to a TV. This is an awesome quality of life improvement for the Switch Lite. Now it's time to take a look at all of the cool things that this Switch Lite can do once we throw some other operating systems at it. We are going to start off with Android. If we head over to ADA64, you can see that we have four A57 cores clocked at just under 2.1 gigahertz. This is a huge increase from stock. When it comes to CPU benchmarks, this is the highest score that I was able to get out of my Switch Lite without extra tools that can pin frequencies to max. This score is basically double the max performance of an RK3566 handheld. In the Vulcan test, we got a score of 4338. The OLED switch can clock a bit higher, and I was able to get 5391 for this test. This is way higher than most of the retro handhelds that are out there today. When it comes to the Wildlife Extreme test, I got a score of 866 on the Switch Lite and 1065 on the OLED switch. Just to put this into perspective, I have a Snapdragon 888 phone that scores 4669 in the Geekbench 5 Vulcan test. This is an apples to apples comparison because I didn't lock the GPU frequencies on the phone for this test. If I use Diablo mode to lock the frequencies, we can beat the Switch Lite and the Switch OLED with a score of 6152. This also isn't an apples to apples comparison because the RM6 used locked GPU clocks for this, but this shows you the performance gap between the Switch Lite and a flagship Snapdragon phone that came out two years later. To be honest, I'm surprised this gap is not bigger, and I'm also surprised by how strong the GPU is in the Switch Lite. Given that this is running Android, we can access Android games and apps. We have enough power here to run a lot of stuff, including native ports for things like Half-Life 1 and Morrowind. We'll run Steam natively on the Switch in just a moment, but we can also use Steam Link to stream Steam games to the Switch. As long as you have a good Wi-Fi signal, which I don't have in this example, this is a decent solution. Finally, we also have the ability to do video out over Type-C with a tool called Screen Copy. This is my preferred method for getting video out from the Switch Lite running Android. I'll point out that Android does have some bugs here and there, so don't go into this thinking that it is perfect because it's not. In this section, we're going to talk all about Linux. By using Linux, we're able to showcase some of the most impressive things that a Switch Lite can do. If you saw some of the videos that I did last year on this router SBC that I got to run Steam and a bunch of other PC games, we're going to try to do all of that on the Switch. This router has a more powerful CPU than the Switch, but the Switch has a better GPU that has more performance and better software support. There are several Linux distros for the Switch Lite right now, but I'm only going to focus on Ubuntu Jammy and Fedora 39. There are pros and cons to each one, and I'll try to go over some of that in this video. That being said, if you want to see more information on any of these topics, the Switchroot website has a lot of information. I'll be honest with you, it's a bit overwhelming at times when you're first getting started, but the steps that you need to follow to be able to do most of what I'm going to do in this video are easy, and you'll only be required to read like one page or so from the website. I'll go over some of that process now. Right now we're in something called Hakate, which we haven't talked about yet. At this point, I've already copied over the files that came with this switch to a larger SD card, and I have it ready to flash Linux. To do that, we need to go over to Tools, and then we need to go into Partition SD Card. In here, we'll analyze the space, and it will show how my partitions are set. This green space is for HOS, and this blue space is where Linux will go. Since I've already done that, I just need to press Flash Linux, and the system will find the installation files that I've already added to the FAT32 partition on this SD card. Once the flashing process is done, we can delete the installation files, and we can go back to Home, and then we can go over to the More Configs menu. Now you'll see that we have an Ubuntu Jammy option. This is going to boot into Jammy without any CPU or GPU overclocks, as well as any increased RAM speeds or custom timings. This is just stock. It will be higher than HOS stock, but it is stock. 
If you want to customize things further, you'll need to consult the Switchroot website because there's a lot that you're able to do with these config files. You'll see that this screen doesn't work right now, and that's because I have a third-party screen installed that this stock system does not recognize. We need to do an update for this system so that the screen will work. To do that, we're going to switch over to my other switch light to finish this process. Here we are in the Ubuntu image. This switch light still has joysticks that need to be replaced, so I'll navigate through this with a USB mouse. The stock system doesn't have that much out of the box, but we can get everything that we need without too much trouble. You can get almost everything that you need with the L4T Megascript app after you do an app update. This script uses a GitHub URL that is blocked in the country that I live in, so it won't work on camera right now unless we do something. To get around this, I'm going to use this RK3588 router SBC that I also did a video on last year. This one has a VPN running on it, and it will tunnel any internet traffic through the onboard VPN. With that connected to the switch, we can do everything that we need. I'm not going to go through everything that's inside this Megascript app, but I will say that this does a lot of stuff for you that would be annoying or time-consuming to do if you were a complete novice to Linux. For example, almost everything that we need uses Box64, and this script will install and configure everything that you need without any fuss. They also have apps and emulators that we'll showcase in the next few sections. But this is my configured jammy build that I will use for this video. I have Conky running on the right side of the screen with almost the same layout that I use on my RK3588 SBCs. I added a few more things to this just to make it a bit easier to see how the system is running at a glance. For this video, I will use the Perf OC All Power Mode. That will allow us to use the highest CPU and GPU clocks that we can use on the Switch Lite. Everything that I need for this video is already installed here, so I'm just going to go through a bunch of what I was able to get running on my Switch Lite. Starting out with some ports, we have a bunch of games that run very well on the Switch Lite. The first one is SM64, which has some strange default control mappings that we need to fix, but the game runs great at a locked 30 FPS in widescreen mode, and it looks great. I also tested Open Morrowind again. This uses a newer build than on Android, and I find that it just works a bit better. Minecraft Java Edition also runs on this. I believe there's another version that runs better than this one, but this is the same version that I used in my RK3588 video, so I wanted to do it again here for an apples to apples comparison. There's an ARM Linux port of Doom 3 that also runs very well on this. It doesn't run at a lock 60 FPS, but it is more than playable. Pretty sweet time, Marine. No. Oh yeah, keep in mind. Civilians are working. Don't get excited. Our final port is OSRS, which doesn't have a native Linux client. This game is playable, which shows that the Switch could support a console port, but I am a bit surprised that it is able to push the Switch this much. Now it's time to get Steam running on the Switch Lite. I talked about this a bit before, but Steam does not run that fast on ARM processors like this using Box64. Steam has a lot of web elements now that take a lot of resources to run under translation. If you have a lot of RAM, it's not that bad, but we only have 4 gigabytes on the Switch, so we need to make use of Swap to get this running. Anyway, here's Steam running on the Switch, and you can see how much this UI is pushing the system. It's very slow, but it should be fast enough to get this to launch some light Steam games. Let's try a very light game with a native Linux port. Here's Freedom Planet, and it runs without any issues, even though we have Steam running in the background. This is another light game, but it doesn't run that well with Steam running in the background. When it comes to native Linux games, those run well on the Switch, especially if they natively support Vulkan, like Torok 3. This game already has a Switch port, and you'll start to notice that most of the games that can run well on the Switch running Linux already have Switch ports, but there are some big titles that don't. This is World of Warcraft. I usually test vanilla WoW on ARM devices due to the 32-bit support, but we only have 64-bit GPU drivers on the Switch Lite, so we need to use a more modern version of WoW, and I decided to go with Cataclysm. To run this game, we need to use a combination of Box64 and Wine, and without doing anything else, we're stuck running the game with Wine D3D. It runs, but it isn't great. In situations like this, we can try to use another tool to bypass Wine D3D. The best thing that we have available to us is something called DXVK, which will run DirectX on Vulkan. Once we do that for WoW, this is how it looks. It's running way better, and I would classify that this is playable. Keep in mind that we're doing a lot of translation right now. 
We have Box64 allowing us to run a 64-bit PC app on an ARM processor, but we also have Wine allowing us to run a Windows application. On top of all of that, we have DXVK translating DirectX to Vulkan. Even with all of that, the game runs this well. The funny thing is that there is an ARM version of World of Warcraft available for Mac and Windows. I really want to know how much better it runs than this, but I don't want to jump down another deep rabbit hole. This video was already deep enough. But can you imagine having a console port to the Switch for a game that is this big? That spell isn't ready yet. <laughs> Moving on, we have Warcraft 3 running at a respectable FPS with all of the same translation layers as our previous title. This is another game that I like to benchmark on ARM devices, and I think this one is running well. I also test Fable, and this one is running well with the same translation. Why are you playing with baby toys? What are you doing? Ah! <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll leave him alone. Just please don't hit me again. I spent a decent amount of time trying to get Halo 1, Halo 2, or the Master Chief Collection to run on this. Halo 2 looked like it was going to run well based on how well Fable was running, but there's an issue with the game not allowing me to break out of cutscenes. Someone may be able to get this to run, but I couldn't, and I'm a bit bummed by it. Not having good access to Steam makes it annoying to test older PC games that I own, but you can find a bunch of Abandonware titles that should work with DXVK. This isn't a uniform process across the board because there are instances where games will have missing graphics if you use DXVK. In those cases, you'll need to use Wine D3D, and at that point, it's probably not worth it. Our last PC game is Silent Hill 3. I tested this just because I want to see if it ran better through all of this translation or as a PS2 ROM. Beyond PC games, you also have access to apps. If you want to emulate games, you can run RetroPie under Ubuntu, and it works just like it does on a Pi. But if we're talking about emulation, we may as well go for broke and go for the GOAT emulator. This is ZSNES, and I don't know how many of you out there are going to have fond memories of this like I do, but it's awesome to see this running on the Switch. It's pointless, but it's awesome. Now there's one big problem with Linux on the Switch that may be a deal breaker for some. It has really bad stuttering that displays differently depending on a few things. To demonstrate this, I recorded Super Mario Land running on Ubuntu versus Android. If you focus on the background mountains and clouds, you'll see that the motion is not smooth. When we go over to Android, you'll see that everything is perfectly smooth. If you are able to notice the difference in these clips, you are already more capable than the people that were supposed to fix it. This stuttering issue is the primary reason why I would not emulate older retro systems like this under Linux. You are far better off in HOS or Android for games like this. Now the reason this exists is a longer topic that I don't want to spend a lot of time on. Essentially, there's an issue with the way that NVIDIA handles rotated displays. The Switch uses a native portrait display that is rotated in software. Once that is done in Linux, we get the stuttering issue. I've been told that this is something that also exists on Linux desktop PCs, but it isn't as obvious with a more powerful processor. This issue spans two years, and the spark notes of this is that it was brought to the attention of NVIDIA to try to get them to fix it. The person that brought it to their attention went above and beyond by trying to create a bunch of test cases that would allow NVIDIA to see and debug the issue that you just saw in the Super Mario clip. At first they couldn't see the stuttering issue. Then they saw it and said that they were in the process of fixing it before ghosting and then saying that the issue was fixed. Long story short, it turns out that they lied about fixing it and they also have no intention of ever fixing it. I'll leave the thread link below if you want to read up on this for yourself, but there's one other issue with the display that is different depending on a couple of things. If you use the Perf OC All Power Mode in Ubuntu like I did, at times you will see lines on your screen. Now I think most people would refer to this as tearing, even if it's not tearing in the traditional sense, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. I found that the higher your GPU clock is, the worse this looks. This is also possible in Fedora 39, but it's less frequent and it only happens at a very high locked GPU clock. When it does happen, it has vertical and diagonal tearing. From testing, this difference comes down to the different BSP versions that are used. And the best thing about Fedora is that it's super easy to switch between the BSP that this comes with 
or the older BSP that is used in Ubuntu. For either Linux distro, you'll need to use the latest BSP if you want to do switch emulation on a switch. Yes, you heard that correctly. More on that later. We covered a lot in this video, but this section holds some of the most surprising things that the Switch can do. In this section, we're going to take a deep dive into the emulation performance of the Switch Lite. There are a lot of pathways that you can take when it comes to emulation on the Switch, so I'll make sure to include some relevant information on the system that I'm using at the bottom of the screen. Let's kick things off with some retro systems with RA on Android 11. Due to the stuttering issue that I pointed out, these are the kinds of games that I would only emulate on Android or HOS. We'll come back to RA in just a bit, we'll switch over to a standalone app to emulate Nintendo DS. We're using Drastic for this, and the Switch Lite has no problems emulating this system with the high resolution 3D rendering option turned on. Our next system is PS1 and we're using the Duck Station emulator. I have the rendering resolution set to 3x native and I'm using widescreen hacks. There's a Duck Station port for Horizon OS that is also a good option for PS1 emulation if you don't want to use Android. Like most of the previous systems, there are a few ways to go about running Nintendo 64 games on a Switch. This is one of the easier ways with the best performance. For these games, I have the rendering resolution set to 720p wide adjusted. We're gonna stick with RA for these next two systems. Here's Sega Saturn and Dreamcast. After testing all of that, I wasn't expecting that PSP would give us any trouble, but I ran into an issue where it ran very slow until I opened up the multitasking view and then went back into the emulator. This could be a clock speed issue, so it might be worth going through the work of getting this Android system rooted so you have full control over the CPU and GPU. Anyway, this system performs very well on the Switch.
now it's time to check out some higher end systems. Our first is GameCube, and I'm gonna hop over to Ubuntu for this because it gave the best performance for me. I have the rendering resolution set to 720p, and I'm pretty impressed with the performance that I was able to get out of my Switch Lite. You won't be able to play the full library here, but it's pretty good all things considered. We're sticking with the same OS and emulator. I am also impressed by how well this runs on the Switch Lite, but our weak CPU is a big bottleneck for a lot of the games from this system. I've got them. We also have a CPU bottleneck when it comes to 3DS emulation, but a lot of games from this system will run well on the Switch Lite. The good thing is that we can even upscale to 720p. go back over to Android for our next system. This is Vita emulation with the Vita 3K emulator. I was not expecting anything to run well on this at all, so it's pretty cool to see that some Vita games are playable on the Switch Lite.
Here's a big system for the Switch that shouldn't even be as good as it is. This is PlayStation 2 with the Aether SX2 emulator running on Ubuntu. The Ubuntu build isn't as up to date as the Android build, but I went with it because I was able to get slightly better performance with the games that I wanted to test. As you can imagine, we need to use underclock settings in this emulator to get bigger games to run. Given that we only have a weak 4 core CPU, I'm kind of shocked that we were able to get bigger games like God of War 1 and God of War 2 to be at a playable state. Before today, I had never tested Xbox emulation on ARM, but there's an ARM Linux build for XMU, and the GPU in the Switch Lite has the required OpenGL version to run it. Even for games with perfect compatibility, it isn't great, but who would have thought that the Switch Lite would be able to emulate anything at all, let alone Jet Set Radio Future in slow mode? I need to preface this last system by saying that this is absolutely pointless to do given that you need a modded system to even be able to attempt this. If you saw a community post that I did not that long ago, I showed that the Switch is capable of emulating Switch games. I don't think I've ever seen a console that could run an emulator that emulates the games that the console can run natively, let alone one that can emulate games at full speed or near full speed. This is ridiculous. For those of you who understand how emulation works, you know how crazy this is. The reason why these games are running as well as they are is due to a few things. The first is that we're running at double the clock frequencies of a stock Nintendo Switch. The second thing is that we're utilizing a recent addition to the Yuzu emulator that can natively execute Nintendo Switch ARM code on an ARM processor. Well, we have an ARM processor since this is a Nintendo Switch, so we don't need to spend resources emulating that. I tested an earlier build of this emulator that did not have this NCE update, and we can emulate the CPU, but only for simple games. We do have to emulate the GPU, but as we've already seen, the GPU in the Nintendo Switch goes hard if you overclock it and you increase the memory bandwidth. In practice, this means that we're going to be running GPU code through a Vulkan backend. Even if this emulator was perfect with no inefficiencies or any compatibility issues, this is still a big accomplishment. Even with the NCE update, bigger Switch games are too demanding for the Switch to emulate with any Switch emulator. I realize how ridiculous that sounds as I'm saying it. Anyway, this is a cool tech demo more than anything else. We touched on a lot in this video, but there's one major update that will hopefully arrive for the Switch Lite later this year, and it is the OLED screen replacement that I teased not that long ago. 
I did a community post about this along with some extended comparisons over on Twitter, but I never talked about it in a video, so here it is. What you see in these clips is a prototype of an OLED screen replacement for the Switch Lite that many people are hyped about, including myself. It's still a bit early in the production of this, but the screen should go for a ballpark of $25 to $50 depending on how many people are interested in it, and it should be widely available. Beyond gaining a superior OLED screen, the mod kit has the potential to give us native 720p HDMI out for the Switch Lite. As we already saw in this video, we have tools to do that over the USB port in HOS and in Android, but this would give you the best picture quality possible out of a Switch Lite, and the best part about all of it is you wouldn't need a mod chip to use it. That is a game changer for a handheld that is already this good. I'll keep you guys posted with more info as I get it. As for this massive video on the Switch Lite in 2024, that's all I've got. These rabbit hole videos take a ton of time to put together and this one is easily the most amount of time that I've ever spent on a single video. If you enjoy deep dive videos like this, show your support any way you can. Leave a like, subscribe to Fight Nintendo Ninjas, and if you're looking for another deep dive video from this series, take a look at a video that I did on the Nintendo DS. Happy gaming everyone, Takiya.